We've just listed several reasons to be suspicious when you're given a single number without a comparator group. Let's now turn to correlations, which are linear relationships between two variables that tend to be misinterpreted. In order to improve our, improve our ability to interpret data, we can assess relationships between variables. For example, we can look at reports to the FDA of abdominal pain over time and assess how many of those patients receive pancreolipase. Correlation alone does not mean that these two variables have a causal relationship. A change in one causes a change in the other. Correlation does not even require that the two variables are related to each other at all. Correlation is a statistic that measures the strength and direction of the linear relationship between two variables. It is calculated on a scale of negative one to one by the variable R, where negative numbers indicate a negative linear relationship. As one variable falls, the other variable increases. And positive numbers indicate positive linear relationships, where one, as one variable increases, the other variable increases. The closer a number is to one, the stronger the linear relationship. For example, the upper right hand uh, image is probably has an R value of about 0.9, indicating a strong positive linear relationship. Numbers closer to zero indicate weaker relationships, and an R value of zero indicates a total lack of linear relationship between two variables. We should be cautious, however, because correlations do not tell us anything about the underlying nature of the relationship between variables. In fact, the variables may not be related at all. To make correlation interpretation simpler, let's break correlations down into three basic categories. Then we'll look at some examples. Our first category will be spurious correlations. These are correlations in which the apparent relationship is false. In reality, the two variables are not related in a meaningful way that we know of, even if the R value is 0.9. It does not mean that the two are connected. Our second category will be confounded correlations. These are correlations in which the apparent relationship is false, but the apparent relationship can, can be explained by the presence of a third variable, also called a confounding variable. Finally, our last category will be causal for potentially causal correlations. These are correlations which describe an actual causal relationship between two variables. However, the correlation or R value does not tell us this. We need to do other investigations to determine causality. Let's look at an example of a spurious correlation. The two variables are U.S. spending on science and number of suicides by hanging, strangulation, suffocation in the U.S. Over time, the two variables are highly correlated. The R value in this case is actually 99.8%, indicating an almost perfectly linear positive relationship. However, just because this is highly significant does not mean that the two variables are related. For example, there's no realistic pathway to suggest that spending more on science spurs suicide in the general population, nor does it mean that more suicides increases more U.S. spending on science, although maybe it causes a slight increase in mental health research because there is no known data to suggest an underlying connection between these variables, we would say the relationship is spurious. This is why people say correlation does not equal causation. Here's another example. The number of people who drown in swimming pools is positively correlated with the number of films Nicolas Cage appears in in any given year. The R value here is 67%, indicating a moderate linear relationship. Again, however, unless Nick Cage is drowning people after his movie premieres to celebrate or people are protesting Nicolas Cage movies by drowning themselves, it is highly unlikely a true relationship exists here and no evidence that the relationship can be explained by a third variable. Therefore, we could classify this as spurious. One last example. This one I included because it may make more intuitive sense and we, we may want to jump to the conclusion that this correlation is causal. It shows that arcade revenue and computer science doctorates have a strong positive linear relationship. The R value is 98.5%. 
you may be inclined to say that this makes sense, that the world is getting nerdier and the more nerds means more uh, computer science doctorates and more arcade revenue. However, the main point of this discussion is to show that correlation does not necessarily equal causation. In order to determine causality, we need a lot more information. For example, maybe we could pull computer science doctorates and non-computer science doctorates to compare their arcade spending habits and determine if there's a significant difference between them. Let's move on to our next category, confounded correlations. These are correlations in which the correlation is actually describing a relationship that is skewed by a third variable. So in our example, ice cream sales and murder. A surprising positive correlation has been found between ice cream sales and murder. When ice cream sales rise, so do homicides. However, there's a confounding variable, heat, which is associated with both ice cream sales and aggressiveness and homicidality. In example two, we've got coffee and lung cancer. Several years ago, a study found that increased coffee consumption was associated with increased diagnoses of lung cancer. So coffee consumption and lung cancer had a positive correlation. However, can you think of a confounding variable here? Smoking, which was associated with increased coffee consumption and cancer risk. Confounding is sometimes called the third variable problem. Confounding variables, known as confounders, are associated with both of the individual variables and may lead us to believe that the two variables have a relationship with each other, which may actually may not be the case. Confounders can cause confusion if they're not assessed by the study investigators. To eliminate confounding, it's important to use comparative studies and make sure you're including all the variables that are associated with the exposure and the outcome. For example, if you want to know if coffee causes lung cancer, you should look at coffee drinkers and non-coffee drinkers, but make sure both groups have an equal number of smokers. We can also control for confounding using statistical analyses called regression modeling. We will discuss that later in the course. So if correlations are so confusing, then why are we using them? Well, correlations and trends, though easy to misinterpret, can be extremely useful. For example, correlations can be seen as signals that point investigators in new directions of research. Positive correlations in epidemiological studies can lead to medical breakthroughs. For example, a positive correlation between strokes and high blood pressure may have led to the conclusion that treating high blood pressure can lower your risk for stroke. This is a truly causal correlation. Also, the correlation between smoking and lung cancer led to research that showed that the relationship is causal. And now we know that smoking cessation can help reduce the risk for lung cancer. However, we should note that these correlation signals alone do not mean that the relationships are causal. We'll discuss causality further next week, but they do mean that further research should be done. Further research can identify the nature of these relationships and potential public health solutions to the problem. This concludes video two. Next, we will look at some of the epidemiological statistics for group comparisons.